This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Diagnosing the Aftermarket A to Z. I'm Matt Fonslow, and we really got to talk about electricity. But first, let's hear a word from our sponsor, Napa Auto Tech Training. Napa Auto Tech offers three-hour virtual technical classes that can be accessed from the comfort of your home. To find out what courses are available, go to NapaAutoTech.com and click on the Napa Auto Tech class calendar link. I've been participating in the uh, ASC Renewal app for a while as a test taker or a user of it. So it's been a few years. I've been using it to keep my credentials current. And yeah, the comment section is a big motivator for this topic tonight. Because if you're listening to this, I'm probably preaching to the choir. And so hopefully this content is good enough to warrant sharing, especially to those that don't normally listen to it. And I don't really mean it from a numbers standpoint. I really don't. It's really about those who don't know need to know. And a podcast is maybe not the greatest venue or medium to try to communicate about electricity, but I got one word comes to mind when I think about some of the comments on some of the questions on the renewal app, and that's damn. I wish it was a sarcastic damn. It's not. It's damn. We're not where we need to be. There's high level electronics and electricity type things that I don't think most people would expect most techs to know or to grasp. But I think a lot of just fundamental stuff seems to be wildly, wildly misunderstood. And I mean wildly. I'm going to try to just talk a little bit about it. And I guess I want to preface this all with talking about electricity is a very difficult subject for me. I love it. I love dealing with electrical problems. I love dealing with electronics. It's my favorite thing to do, but I also struggle to talk about it because as you've probably heard on this podcast, on the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast with Sean Tipping that I've been lucky to be a guest on a few times and we've talked about it, I am caught and I feel like drawn and quartered between accuracy and applicability. And it's probably not quartered, it's split in half right down the middle. So accuracy, the problem with that is it sounds all fine and dandy, right? I want accurate information. I want to know exactly how it works. The problem is, is the reality of how it works is complex. I don't even know if I will mean it so much in a conceptual way, but complex in that there is nothing that you or I interact with that behaves like electricity, like electrons do at the quantum level, because that's what it is. If we wanted accuracy, I would have to do a podcast on quantum field theory. And I just don't trust myself to be knowledgeable enough to communicate it, nor would it be worth anyone's time to listen to other than being able to bow it off about quantum field theory and electricity. I, I don't see how it helps anyone accomplish anything. I ended up looking into it just one of them rabbit holes. And honestly, it was trying to start writing a class for a a company, doesn't matter who, about electricity and specifically current probes. And so then I asked myself, what is a magnetic field for real? And that opened up, whatever you want to call it, opened up the gates of hell or opened up the rabbit hole or shot me into the matrix, I did not take the blue pill. And I was super interested. Like, it's so interesting. It's really difficult to apply it to -to day-to-day. So then we go to applicability, which a common way to talk about electricity is almost like water or hydraulics. And I tell you what, there's a lot of cars that have been repaired successfully, efficiently, when the tech working on it was thinking about electricity as water. I don't know that I want to talk in any of those terms. So I think I'm just going to go and just see where it takes me. I think I'm just going to point this thing north and hit the gas and see what happens. I'm not magnetic north. I think we have the glossary of terms, right? We have volts that we deal with. We have amps 
or current that we deal with. And then we have resistance. Those are like the main players. You've probably heard about Ohm's law. And if you know about Ohm's law, or even if you don't, it's an equation, right? It's mathematical. E equals I times R. That's Ohm's law. Maybe an easier way to think about it in terms we use, because we don't speak about volts as E. We really don't speak about current as I. We say resistance, but we don't really say it in that way. A lot of times it's just ohms. So maybe a better way to think about it is V equals C or A. If I want to talk about like the value, so maybe it's better yet. V equals A times O. That way it's volts equal amps times ohms. More importantly than really knowing that equation is the relationships. So we have volts, which is really, we're going to say the pressure. And if we want to talk more electrical, it's potential, but it's, we're talking about the push, right? So on a vehicle, for the most part, we have our 12 volt battery, right? And I I get it where we could talk about EVs and hybrids and all that, but just to keep this at the level, I think to at least start, we have the 12 volt battery. Okay. 12.6. We're kind of going to get really nitpicky about this. We have the 12 volt battery and we have a positive side and we have a negative side. And you could say one side has an abundance of electrons. That side would be the negative side because an electron's charge is negative. And not to get into all the physics of it, but things inherently have a charge to them. It's a part of nature. We don't even have to go into hows and the whys. It's just that's the way it is. So electrons are negatively charged, protons positively, neutrons neutral, not, they they don't carry a charge. So one side of the battery is an abundance of electrons. The other side is a deficit. So it wants to balance itself. It wants equilibrium. It wants to be at that lowest energy state, which you'll hear about. I guess you'll hear about me talk about not so much anymore, but that's what it wants. It wants to equal that out. So there's this pressure on the negative side of the battery to push those electrons over to the positive side. It's just, they can't get there. We create a circuit between the two. And if we just made it a wire, jump the wire from one side to the other, that wire would pass that current. So those electrons are going to start moving through that cable, through that wire. The wire becomes the conductor and the load. And therefore, there's going to be something that happens, generally heat. And it'll get hot enough that it'll glow, you might start smoking. That's what's happening, is it that those electrons want to get from the negative side to the positive side. Just trying to speak in the most simplest of terms and not trying to treat anybody like a dummy. It's really just trying to keep this applicable. That's what's going on. That's what's trying to happen. Now, when we start the vehicle, it really shifts from the battery to the alternator. And then that same thing happens where we have this abundance of electrons trying to get to the other side, inside the alternator, if you will, inside and outside. I mean, we're going to get, again, nitpicky. So that's what's pushing this stuff. That's why we have this current flow, is they're just trying to get back. And I don't want to say back home. They're trying to get to the other side. It's really what they're trying to do, to balance things out, to hit equilibrium. The voltage is how much pressure there is pushing that. How much is that potential difference from one side to the other? We said it, 12 volts. In a way, it's an arbitrary number. In a way. Can we dive into physics and find the answer? (laughs) Yes. For our purposes, we don't care. It's 12 volts. That's the potential difference. That's the pressure difference. The current amps is the value we measure it in. Same with volt, volts. We have electromotive force. The value that we measure it in is volts. If we want to measure the pressure of water, we use PSI or kilopascals. It's there. It's just a value we give them or a scale. And volts is a universal scale for electrical pressure. Amps is a universal scale for current. And that is one way to think about it is maybe like the number of electrons, the flow, the volume, the mass, if you will. And we call that amps or amperes, amps for short, and then resistance. What is opposing that movement? What's restricting that flow? And with the water analogy, what's kinking off that hose? 
or what resistance does, this hose, does the hose itself offer? We assign that ohms. That's the scale for the resistance. And we've defined what those terms are. The important thing with Ohm's law is trying to understand that the relationship between those three, and most specifically for our world, voltage stays fairly normal or, or in a zone, right? We're going to see 12, 14 volts, somewhere in there. It doesn't change a whole lot. Again, we're not talking about EV, not talking about hybrids, we're not talking about some whacked out electrical problem. Just for the most part, it stays in that range. So now the big players are resistance and current. And for our day-to-day, the relationship we have to really hammer home in our heads, the one that has to make the most sense is when resistance goes up, current goes down. So if you want to write this down or just do it in your head, I'm going to try to keep the numbers really simple. If we have 12 volts, right, it equals 12 volts. and We want to see what happens to current if we change the resistance. So if I have 12 volts pressure, and we'll just say one ohm of resistance, what times one is going to equal 12? Think about that. Voltage equals current times resistance, or voltage equals amps times ohms. Did you come up with 12? Excellent. It's 12 amps of current. Great. Okay. Well, what if we change the resistance again? We still have 12 volts of pressure, if you will. Now the resistance goes up to two. It doubled. What times two is going to equal 12? Write this down if you want. If you can do it in your head, great. It might help to just write it down, not so much because you can't do it in your head, but to really see what's going on. Resistance goes up, current goes down. Volts is 12. We took the resistance. We went up to two. The amps dropped, right? What times two equals 12? Six. Half. Again, resistance doubled. Current or amps was cut in half. It's really important to understand. Also, we could change it again, and maybe I should have picked a better number, but whatever. Let's go with it. What if we have something that shorts, like a load? Okay, some sort of a winding. Maybe it's a solenoid. Normally, it's one ohm. But now it's something happens internally. Now it's half. Okay. Math just got a little bit harder. I didn't help you out as much as I thought I would. Still have 12 volts of pressure. And now we're going to take that resistance, the ohms. And instead of one, it's 0.5. 0. 0.5. Half an ohm. Can you do the math? What happened to our current? Did you come up with 24? Because that's what it is, right? 24 times. 0.5 or 0.5 equals 12, or half of 24 is 12. Could you see why a shorted solenoid then would blow its 20 amp fuse, or 15 amp fuse, or 10 amp fuse? Let's just say in this case it was normally one ohm, normally it would run 12 amps. It's shorted somehow internally, went low impedance if we want to talk smart. Now it's 0.5. Boom, 24. It was fused at, say, 15 amp. 15 amp fuse for this solenoid that's normally one ohm, runs at 12 amps, it's fused for 15, good to go. Something happened to that solenoid, something happened to our load, and now the current shot way up, blew the fuse. That's just, I think, two really important pieces of information or takeaways from Ohm's Law to walk away with. It's a powerful concept to understand that when resistance goes up, current goes down. Or if resistance goes down, current goes up. One trick I have seen is that if you draw Ohm's law in the conventional way, and it doesn't matter if it's the conventional way or any way, really. Like say you want to find what the resistance should be when you have the voltage and current. Or you want to find out what the current should be when you have the voltage and the resistance. That you put your finger over what it is you want to see. And this is where I think it helps to have it written in the, the conventional way that we see Ohm's law, which is usually volts with a line across underneath it. So like it's sitting on a table. And then under that table, to the left, you have amps. And to the right, you have ohms. And between 
those two between amps and between ohms, there's an X, like a multiplicator, like the times sign to multiply. So if you want to find out what the amps should be, you put your finger over the current, whether you have it in your drawing as I, as it was conventionally, or C for current, or A for amps, you put your finger over that, you block it. And now you see that you have voltage over resistance or ohms. And now you know to take the voltage and divide it by the ohms. So if you have this solenoid and you look up a specification and it says it should be 12 ohms of resistance, you know there's 12 volts there. We put our finger over the amps and we see voltage divided by resistance or voltage divided by ohms. 12 divided by 12 is one. We would expect one amp. And now you can go test it. You could use your low amp current probe. You could get your ammeter in series and you can turn that solenoid on or turn that load on and wait because it should stay at that level or start dropping a little bit. As things heat up, resistance does go up. Resistance goes up, current goes down. That's what we would expect. But if it's failing, you have an intermittently shorting, whatever you want it to be, intermittently shorting purge control solenoid, intermittently shorting shift solenoid, doesn't matter. You leave that on for a little bit, not saying a lot, long, and you have to use your head a little bit. How much current are we talking about? How big are the wires going to this thing? One amp, probably on the safer side. Okay, some things are intentionally low resistance for purposes that they pulse. They don't ever really hold it just to ground or just energize it and leave it on. They pulse it and that's how they regulate whatever the load is doing, whatever that solenoid's doing, if you will, whatever that light bulb's doing, whatever it is they're controlling. That's how they're controlling current flow. That's how they're also minimizing heat generation and de destruction circuitry to it or the wires, the conductors. But I think with one ohm and we can look at our wank schematic, determine the size of the wires in the circuit, what it's fused for. Okay, leave it on a little bit. What happens? Is it on for 30 seconds and all of a sudden the current shoots way up? You had an expected value of one amp. You left it energized with your low amp probe around it, with your ammeter, and it shoots up. Boom, you found it. For 98 years, the Napa name has meant quality parts and service. It also reflects top quality training programs to help you build a more successful vehicle repair business. No doubt, the technician shortage is impacting everyone, but you're not facing this battle alone. Napa has the solution by making Napa Auto Tech training available near you. Napa Auto Tech provides automotive aftermarket technicians career development opportunities through structured, disciplined, measured, and high-quality technical instruction, no matter the technician or service advisor skill level. This instruction enhances understanding of vehicle systems, increases first-time repair capability, and overall customer satisfaction. It also prepares technicians to become ASE certified. It's a fact technicians who receive training to improve their knowledge and skills have a higher sense of job satisfaction. This reduces technician turnover and increases productivity, directly improving a shop's profitability. It is vital to the success of a shop's business that today's technicians are equipped to diagnose and repair today's complex vehicles. With our ever-changing technology, the technician's knowledge and skills need to be updated and refreshed on a regular basis. As you labor over the decision of whether to send your techs to get their skills sharpened, keep in mind, Napa Auto Tech training is an investment, not an expense, and it's available to all. Much of Napa Auto Tech's training is offered in more than one format to accommodate varieties of learning styles and training preferences so each person can maximize their learning. Whether you're more of a hands-on person or enjoy learning at your own pace, Nap Auto Tech is here to provide you with the training you need and the format that works best for you. To learn more about what Nap Auto Tech offers, contact NapaAutoTech.com. The next part I think I want to talk about is your meter. Contrary to what that Sean Tipping says about the ohm meter. I'm just kidding. That was a good episode. And I was on hits. I think one of my very first episodes was about me using an ohm meter on a CAN network. But not really here to talk about the ohmmeter. I'm here to talk about the voltmeter specifically. I want you to think about what that's telling you. And I know immediately you're like, well, duh, it's a voltmeter. So it's showing me the electrical pressure. Yeah, 
I think a better way to think about the meter is almost like a calculator, specifically one that does subtraction. I think if you think about the meter reading is that what you're seeing is a value of the red lead, the positive lead, if you will, the red lead minus the black lead or the common or the ground lead, whatever you call that. That's what it's showing you. So if you go across the battery, the 12 volt battery, 12.6 volt battery, the red leads on the positive cable, black leads on the negative cable, we're seeing a potential difference of 12 volts or 12.6 volts, whatever the voltage is, right? The ground is zero. The positive is 12. And granted, what I told you before, we can get really convoluted with that. Okay. We have things going on about how things were talked about years ago versus what they're known to be now. We just have to ignore that. Okay. I know it sucks. A lot of us, I think, can do that. We can have the electron theory versus conventional theory. I think it's okay. I think we understand it still works. We might just get a little loony with the positive or negative sign. Black lead on the negative or the common lead on the meter connected to the battery negative, the positive lead, the red lead on battery positive terminal. You're seeing positive minus the negative. 12.6 volts is 12 volt difference between the positive and the negative. If we go to a, a sensor, then we back probe it. The difference between it and we'll just say in this case, it's reference to battery negative. We see five volts a lot of times. Okay. That's just the difference. That's the potential difference. That's the voltage pressure difference. People that do a lot of electrical work reference battery negative as much as possible and also try to verify that battery negative is very, very, very close to the same, if not exactly the same as an engine ground, like some more metal on the engine, the engine block, the somewhere on the chassis or the frame, frame rail, the body. That's a good real initial test. Are all those the same? If the engine's running, you could technically go to the back of the alternator. That should be the lowest, theoretically. Honestly, if things are good with the cable sizes, the battery negative and the back of the alternator with the engine running should be the same. And I guess honestly with it all running, but what happens is when we start moving away from that, and it's not a critique, it's just the reality, is we start testing things with a different ground and specifically a bad ground. You're looking at the difference again, that subtraction. So if I move my test lead, my black test lead, the common lead, the reference lead, I move that to this crusty ground because I'm testing something underneath the car. I don't have a good jumper wire to go from battery negative down to where I'm testing. So I'm trying to reference. I see this ground cable. So I'm referencing. I'm using that. I'm clipped onto that. I'm stabbed into that. Whatever I got to do, right? I don't think the stabbing, unless you're absolutely destroying the freaking wire, is so much unprofessional. It's how you're handling it after the fact is going to determine whether that's professional or not. You need to get your signals. You need to get contact. So whatever you do, you've clipped onto this ground, but it's a bad ground. Let's just t- say we're, we're testing the fuel pump, the low pressure fuel pump, if you will, the lift pump, the one in the fuel tank. So you don't have a lead that gets you from the battery negative back there, but there's a nice looking ground looking underneath to the frame rail. So that's where you reference and you're looking at the voltage to the fuel pump and you're seeing eight volts. The issue is, is where you're referenced. If it's not the same as battery negative, let's just say there's a voltage drop. Let's just say it's got some resistance. So I can, maybe I skipped that. Maybe I need to back up a little bit. That test, whenever we're taking our probes on a voltmeter and touching wherever to wherever, that is a voltage drop. That's what that's called. So if you go from battery negative to battery positive, that's a voltage drop. You go from the battery negative to the back of a throttle position sensor. That's a voltage drop. If you take and reverse leads around and you just get crazy and you take the red lead, the positive lead, and you clip the battery positive and then you test the voltage to a fuel injector, that's still a voltage drop. We'll just say it's a fuel injector. What would you expect to see? If they're the same, 
the voltage drop, the voltage potential difference, the calculator subtraction is going to read very close to zero, if not zero. They're the same. It's not that much different than just taking the leads and probes and stabbing either side of the positive battery terminal. It's going to read zero or very, very, very close. That's a voltage drop. That's that voltage potential difference. It's hardly anything. They're the same. The issue is, is you don't always know without an extra test, another reference. What is it really? Because if I just take the battery terminal off and I measure it, it could be zero as well. There's no voltage there, but it's zero. There's the, the potential difference is negligible if not non-existent. There is no difference. That's what your meter is doing. That's what a voltage drop is, okay? We're going back under the car, testing that fuel pump. Sorry for jumping around on you. I just thought, thought I, better, I better mention what that is. I don't want to be just tossing out terms and assuming everyone knows or expecting you to just quick look it up. I hope that explains it and if there was any doubt. Now we're back to that fuel pump and we're reading eight volts. But my reference lead, my black lead is clipped to a ground stud or a ground cable that I found underneath the vehicle. I can't trust that that's actually ground. I have to verify because if the that voltage drop, the difference, the potential difference between that ground cable and battery negative is four volts, I'm not chasing a voltage feed issue to the fuel pump. I'm chasing a ground issue. Now, granted, a lot of us would have arrived at that slightly differently if we're referencing the battery negative. We got a really long cable that we've bought, built, we're clipped on the battery negative, and now we're probing the voltage feed to the fuel pump, and we're going to see our 12 volts or whatever system voltage and determine it's good. And then we test the ground. And when we move that positive lead from battery, from the voltage feed to the fuel pump to the ground, then we would see that four volts and go, oh, problem. I have a ground problem. I can't get rid of voltage. It should be close to zero. I have four volts. Okay. Maybe one way to think about that, and I don't know if I'm making things more complicated, but if we built ourselves a really simple circuit, okay, we got a we got a piece of wire or a few pieces of wire, let's just say a few pieces of wire and a couple of light sockets with some light bulbs in them. And we'll just say they're 194 bulbs and I string just one of those. So it's just one 194 bulb across the battery. If I take my voltage probes and I go just right across the bulb and the bulb's glowing brightly, I would see 12 volts or 12.6 volts. Okay. And if I moved my leads and I saw the clipped me positive lead to battery positive and I probed the voltage feed side on the, the positive side of that bulb, I would see very, very close to zero volts because the voltage from battery positive terminal where my red lead is or my positive lead is right now to where my black lead is right where it goes into the bulb is very close to the same, if not arguably, arguably the same, at least for just our level of talking here, what our level of conversation needs to be, they're the same. So the meter's going to show zero. And if I take those leads and I move them and I take the black lead, the, the common lead, and I clip that to battery negative, and I take the positive lead and I go to the ground side of that bulb now, the negative side, again, I would see very low voltage, if not zero. For the purposes of conversation, it would be zero. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Because now let's add another bulb. What I want you to picture in your mind or draw on a piece of paper as I explain this is we have our battery. We're going to set one 194 bulb. It's pigtail. It's going to be clipped to battery positive. And then it's negative side of what would have been clipped to the negative side. We're going to hold in our hand and then we're going to take our other bulb. It's pigtail. And we're going to clip them together. And then we're going to take the other side of that new 194 bulb, the second one, we're going to clip that to battery negative. We've just created what's called a series circuit. Makes sense, right? The two bulbs are in series. You're going to notice that the bulbs do come on, but they're not as bright as it was when it was just the one bulb. And now if we take our meter and measure this, go from battery positive to battery negative, we're going to see our 12 volts. 
Now if we take, just leave that battery, leave the common lead, the black lead on battery negative, and we go up to that feed side, the positive side of the first bulb, we're going to again see 12 volts. Let's go to the other side, the ground side, but it's not grounded directly to the battery anymore. It's going through the second bulb. What would you expect to see? I think the clue here is the bulbs are the same, okay? You're going to see about six volts, pretty darn close. So that means this voltage drop, this pressure is getting split up. So we've dropped, it's going to, the current is going to be the same, but it's now shared between two loads. So we're going to see this effect on voltage. The voltage dropped in half. We have two similar, if not the same bulb. You're going to see six volts. You go to the, the input of that second bulb, you're going to again see the six volts. But if you go to the negative side, the one that is connected to battery negative, you're going to see very, very close to zero volts. That's what's happening with this ground scenario. Only the bulbs aren't the same. The loads aren't the same. The resistance of the ground is not the same as the resistance of the electric motor. And that's why we have a difference. So maybe if we pop, we take away one of the 194 bulbs and we stick in a headlight, something that draws like six amps, it might not even hardly light up. Maybe a very faint glow. The 194 bulb will be very, very bright. And you're going to measure voltage differences between the, the bulbs. The drops across the bulbs will be different. And that 194 bulb could represent a bad ground, high resistance, cannot flow current. And we see that affecting the pressure, not unlike, at least for applicability purposes, squeezing a hose. You got a garden hose, you kink it off a little bit. If the most pressure that the spigot can, that's coming out of the spigot is going to be 12 PSI, it can't go higher. You can kink it off and the pressure on that side will go to 12 and it can't go higher. There's nothing to generate more, but you start restricting it. The pressure on the other side is going to go really, really low. But if I start letting loose a little bit, the pressure on the other side is going to go up a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. Not terribly different than what we're talking about here with the bulbs and the loads and the resistances. So I just think it's really important to think about what that meter is doing. It's a calculator. It's an electrical potential calculator, and all it can do is subtract. That's all it can do. So think about that. If you're going across the battery positive to the feed side of the bulb, and if they're the same voltage, the meter will read zero. And if you verify that the voltage at that battery positive is indeed 12 volts, you just proved in a slightly backwards way, that is good. If we added some sort of a resistance to that wire in Minnesota, maybe I got a car shipped from me from my buddy up in Michigan. Brian Pollock's up there stabbing wires and that wire, that vehicle shows up at my shop and this bulb does not glow very bright. One of the headlights doesn't glow very bright. That's a complaint. And I found where Brian's been stabbing his power probe and it's just all green in there, green corrosion. If I know coming from the fuse block that there's 12 volts and I prove it, just assume I prove it and I go from that fuse to the positive side, the input side of that headlight and it reads 10 volts, that's a two volt drop. I've just proven to myself that there is something going on between those two points. I certainly, certainly could have just clipped to the battery negative, went to the fuse, saw that it's 12 volts, went to the bulb, saw that it was 10 volts, and then looked at my wiring schematic or whatever and worked my way to the problem where ultimately the important thing is Brian stabbed the wire and didn't fix it the right way. I think that's all we really care about talking about. Just kidding. He would have done it. I would have blamed somebody else. It's a different way of thinking, but it's valid. If you just do it all on its own, you can't assume the 12 volts is really there. Let's just think about that. What if the fuse was blown and I just go, I'd luck out whatever side I picked happens to be the side that feeds the bulb. If the fuse is blown, there's no voltage there. And I check that. I go from whichever lead to whichever lead. The positive lead, my red lead on the fuse, the side of the fuse that feeds 
that headlight bulb. And then I go to the headlight bulb, the input side, that fuse is blown. I will read zero volts. They're the same. There's no voltage difference between the two because the fuse is blown. If I would have went to the other side, I would have saw a massive drop. I would have seen a 12 volt drop, right? Because the fuse is open. So think about that. It's an absolutely valid test to do that. Many people do that, but you do have to verify the voltages, the proper voltages where it should be to begin with. And I think a lot of us just for ease of our brains, mm. clip to battery negative and leave it. And I'm not saying that's bad, but you can test your understanding of what the meter is telling you by thinking about it differently and understanding what the meter is telling you. Probably heard enough about this from me for a while. Let me know if you like this type of content. Let me know if there's something I accidentally glossed over you would like to hear more elaboration on. Let me know if this is a a topic to keep going on and what you would like to learn about electricity or electronics. You guys email me a lot of great stuff. Please keep it up. And yeah, I don't have really any other updates to give. Things are going really good. I hope they're going good for all of you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Napa Auto Tech Training for sponsoring. Thank you to the Aftermarket Radio Network for making this all possible. And until next time, please take care. You've been listening to Matt Fonslow diagnosing the aftermarket A to Z on the Aftermarket Radio Network. Follow Matt on your favorite listening app. He's very interested in what you have to say. Let him know what you'd like him to cover and come on the show. Matt is all for advancing the aftermarket. Find Matt Fonslow on social media and connect or on aftermarketradionetwork.com.